Hi, this is M. Ward, and you're listening to showbizmonkeys.com. Around this town, I'm all right. Around this town, I'm all right. I mean, no consequence when you're playing with the fire. Move to the left, man. I got my headphones on from the minute I'm up to the minute I go to bed. We are here in the Mounties tour bus behind the Garrick Center in Winnipeg uh, with, surprisingly, Mounties. Uh, thanks for joining us, guys. Thank you for having us. Christmas oranges. Oranges. We're gonna do the pass the mic thing today. Um, so yeah, the the first thing I want to talk about is just uh, when when your band formed in this this new age that we live in. I found out about it because you guys started tweeting about it before you know media had. I guess someone might might have picked it up, but I you know I hadn't heard it anywhere else. I heard it from yeah. you guys talking about it. Is that like is it really neat that you can? not only connect with fans but like the whole world that way and then you know announce your own personal projects and new things directly to people now well it seems like the people that are breaking the news first are people that are on twitter that are <laughs> watching what's going on because yeah. that's where things happen first so and hoxley on a friday just steve finished a video on a thursday that he had made himself for headphones and um we were just super excited about it Trip, tripping out on this video that Steven made in two days or a day essentially and and uh, Hoxley on a Friday just tweeted about it and by Monday it was on the radio and it was, yeah it's weird because you know what I didn't I still don't really buy into this like technology is here to save us all thing and like thank God for the internet because now all of us musicians can finally reach that audience we've been dying to reach all these years <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm so, like to me the internet isn't a savior it's sort of a, a dark miracle you know and um, but in this instance with this band it kind of did work like you know and and I don't put much uh, weight into it I sort of feel like that you know uh, maybe it's too because we were kind of all had record deals maybe at around the time when labels went you know there was a lot of murmuring within labels about the internet and how they were going to be able to monetize this and monetize that and ultimately their hubris and sort of their they, they weren't able to in any way kind of um, to be malleable enough to sort of see into the future and to be you know an active participant in the kind of in the currency of what the internet was offering but so for me I always just thought it was a bit of a foolish thing people were always musing about it but it but then Steve you're, you're probably the opposite guy right because you're I mean technology it's I'm very curious about it and I love it and I'm going to play with it because it's a giant toy um, That's awesome. <coughs> what? <laughs> uh, so I'm just I'm just I'm just rolling with the punches. I don't know. Yeah, I flip flop on it. Steve Albini gave a speech recently in Australia that where he talks about all the reasons why it is the internet has been great for music. And I agree with all his points, but um, there is a lot of darkness to it as well. And it's music's become there's it feels more disposable uh, here today gone tomorrow. I do notice that. But how did we get into talking about this? Well, like about the internet, like reaching fans. Like are we? Oh t right, yeah, Twitter. Um, I've never been good at it, but I've just been watching. Twitter's the one thing that Hoxley does love, yeah. and I think it's because it's communication based happens to be online but it, if it was you know a new breed of messenger pigeons i'm sure you'd be all over that oh, too yeah. you know right uh terry and like gil yeah. um michael oh no michael died no michael <laughs> didn't come back but michael still might be around he's talking about his messenger yeah, I'm, pigeons I'm worried he just flew away well, hopefully he's, he's doing all right yeah, and yeah. He'll comes be back, back. He's, and he'll be michael Steve would name a bird Michael. Um, now your band didn't obviously form on Twitter, 
Uh, that's just how you announced it. Uh, what was the that? Because you've talked about it before, of course. But um, when when you guys first did get together, what uh, made you think, okay, let's go forward with this. Let's let's actually make a band. Let's not just jam together. Let's let's do this. I mean, I think it was within the first day or two. I remember, sort of like I often do, if something really inspire, like if I feel like something's really big, I stand on chairs and and I, you know, I start proclaiming it to the entire room or anybody who will listen. To get on the roof. Yeah, like I just I need to stand on something tall and start yelling about how incredible it was. And like after about three days in the studio, it was like I think I was going. Ape shit, but it felt it straight away. It felt great, and then for me at least, we were in Vancouver for a week. We did headphones and a couple of other songs, and then I flew to Germany. And I just the whole flight and the whole time I was there listening over and over again to the demos, and it was like this music is very very special. That's how I felt anyway. Yeah, we mixed. We had like rough mixes of ten songs when he left, and. I think you carried with you ten songs, or yeah. we sent with you yeah. ten songs. So they were really rough, but but headphones was there, uh, twig in the tree was there, was dance catches on was there as well. Yeah, yeah, there was a lot. I I know that uh, it was a weird time because I don't like to listen to stuff that I'm going to be working on more later because there is a spike of creativity that happens when something's fresh, and I knew at least for mixing purposes because Ryan and I like to mix the music ourselves so I could I wouldn't let myself listen to it so I was getting all these emails from Hawk flipping out for months but I was just I was finishing up some other projects and I so I was like in three months trust me I'm going to be with you I, I can't listen to it yet and then you came back for round two our second writing session and we started that night by listening to what we had done at the first session a couple months before that or something and I was just like whoa this is actually way crazier than now I get why you were tripping on it so much and because I remember it being incredible when we were doing it but I I intentionally blocked it out of my mind until you know what I mean like I'm weird like that it needs to be except for dance catches on that's the thing that we worked on in between I think We, we were editing it down from whatever it was 25 minutes or something 15 minutes and then and I was editing it down and then you started mixing it so that's the only thing I think we worked on in between which okay, yeah. which um, but yeah, yeah it was it was yeah, the, initially it was regimented whereas Hawk had the initial just all the rough drafts um, and I think it, that was maybe what got me extra stoked was your enthusiasm as always which is infectious <laughs> Did the sound that you kind of intended to create in that first jam session, um, did it materialize as the album went on, or like did, did the end result kind of change from what you thought you were going to produce at the beginning? Well, I think people that say, oh, I had a sound in my head, I think that's bullshit, you know? <laughs> and, and to think that all of us sat around and said, yeah, no, we know exactly what we're going to do, is is not the way it is not the way it was and not the way it ever can be I don't think you know so we would just we just started making making songs up and that's what came out you know I think a lot of the songs sound unique to themselves on the record like Twig in the Tree does not sound like pretty respectable does not sound like you know headphones and we knew that each one of them was an anomaly and we treated them as such yeah I, t- I just was just go in and it's like ah, ah, ah. Totally. like I can never I wish I could think of something and pull it off exactly but like I remember it was Rai you were saying you maybe we're going to get Andrew from Sloan to play drums or whatever like when we were sort of plan, pre-planning the sessions I don't even know if you guys knew that like I didn't know that I was going to play the drums but I didn't know if you knew that I played the drums like, like there was so little in the way of like 
premeditation when it came to getting together like it just started to come out and I mean I mean maybe I sort of thought maybe we would like write some synth pop ditties that would get on the radio and maybe make us some extra bucks or whatever but I didn't think I didn't think it was going to be like magic rock music from another time like you know like I really thought maybe just we'd get three clever guys together and have a laugh putting something together on a laptop but it turned into a rock band where everywhere we go we cart around like loads and loads of you know of Turned into Pink Floyd. yeah it's like it's like we yeah for some reason yeah it's Led Zeppelin on stage now like with a synthesizer yeah we toured uh, on a tour across the country and we we took you know tons of gear and it all ended up in Toronto and then we flew home Steve and I and and the rest of the band and then we realized we had a lot of things to do out here so we had to put together a whole new set of gear so I I spent st three days with Steve and Carrie putting together you know another set of gear so we have a lot of stuff we realize and um, and it is about in some ways it's about having the right tools with this band because we are doing music that is from a different era right isn't that yeah, true I think, yeah but I'm just thinking about I, I am the right tool for this band <laughs> you are <laughs> he is the right tool but we had I had no idea that he played drums like that like I don't know the percentage of usable you don't have to edit drums that you get out of him it's unprecedented to me I've never rec I've never recorded that much finished drums immediately automatically off the top of his head I've never seen it before so and I think the same thing with vocals like both of these guys just grab songs out of the air and so you just got to keep up I think when you're in my position um, now having listened to your album a lot and seen you uh, when you were last in Winnipeg for uh, during Juno Fest um, it can be said pretty uh, confidently that you guys are a full-on rock and roll band yeah and uh, that's you know that's familiar to you two but you've never really been in a rock band you've had you've fronted your own stuff but you've never been part of this full-on rock and roll band is that something you've wanted to be a part of throughout your uh, music career well I mean in the early days I wanted to start a couple of bands with a couple of people who didn't want to be in bands and then um, <clears throat> you know I always like I'm sort of somebody who sits and thinks about you know the science and magic of why certain things in music are because there's so much that uh, there's so many intangibles you know there's so many factors that can't be accounted for it's like that I can have a great show in a shitty venue or have a shitty show in a great venue like the stars are not yours to control or align they're for you to just play by the rules that they send down and I, I sort of feel like okay so I can look at bands and go why were the Beatles great well they were great for these reasons you know there was the competitive nature between Paul and John there was sort of this loping yet predictable drum sensibility from Ringo and then well why was you too great well you can I can go and itemize why they were great and then there's that cosmic element to all those great bands the police you name it that that can't you can't you can't sort of calculate so I understood that but I'd never felt it and then being in a band with these guys it's like oh I get it when you put three people in in a in a situation to make music and it starts to feel very exciting and very special you can't remove one and then put somebody else in and have the same result if you know what I mean like there really is a sum of the parts equals magic kind of element that I think some bands just have and some bands just don't and so I kind of I know that that's out there and I know it exists but I wasn't expecting to ever feel it personally especially at being a middle-aged man I like to feel it you know like I sort of feel like that's off the table once you hit north of 27 years old you know also I feel like you know the what what we're doing we couldn't have done when we were 27 you know That's true. we all came to this with a bunch of experience well, could have <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe no. we could have I don't think so though I think that it's because we're all producers and we're at a certain point where we're we're, we're not making demos anymore and then like flushing out the demos and mm -hmm. and sitting and rearranging the songs we're creating songs off the top of our heads and going straight to what is the point of you know the end result of the song yeah. so uh, I think that we came to it with a lot of tools that maybe we didn't have as kids and kids don't have you know so I wanted to touch on the fact that you all are successful producers outside of the fact that you're successful musicians and I was curious when when the production side of things happened did it work well that you all had that experience or was it at times a situation of too many cooks in the kitchen 
I think, yeah. Well, everyone, remember the first time we got together, Hoxley, after, because you've done probably the most records of all of us, like 30 records or something crazy, right? Oh, yeah, but, yeah. But I remember Hoxley was like, the more I produce, the less I know what a producer is even supposed to do. And that kind of made me go, huh, yeah, what is... Um, so, you know, with some bands, they should be doing demos and they should be doing a bunch of tracks and they should be tuning. And But I think Ryan's approach, Ryan's been getting more and more into just natural moments and things being, leave all the warts and all, you know. Um, and I, I think maybe just because we've been, we're just at the stage where we've been doing it long enough that the warts are okay to leave. So I'm not saying everyone should leave leave them, <laughs> um, but but your style was different than my style, and you know like Ryan set up all the gear for our first recording, and I think when Hawk went and was just like hit the kick drum, you know it wasn't like a doof, it was like a <laughs> I was like oh okay I need to play this kind of beat now and so yeah, it's true like it it was Ryan's production style I think that influenced us yeah I agree like and it's funny I haven't thought too much about it but it's true like Ryan really set up the initial sessions and the sounds that sort of became the sound of the band were basically that was your creation I think like I because I'm kind of I don't know lazy or whatever I I, and I also don't mind I like to come in and play other people's gear I don't um, like I like to, to sort of see the world through other people's lenses and so Ryan just set up this crazy drum set that more or less played me and I don't know whether you had, again that's a lot of times I think with production and music in general so much of it is instinct you know and but you know I must admit playing in this band has really fucked up my vision of production and music in general like because of what comes out of the three of us with such sort of ease and not not like glib ease like oh this is such a cinch like this is like been decades between the three of us of arriving at this place but it's it's the inventiveness and the imagination in the music like all of a sudden i find it hard to just listen to any old music like you know somebody oh i've heard this song like yeah like i don't know it's not it's not music for me anymore like for some reason this band has really ruined me because it's so full of a vital energy and vital information i find that listening to music that doesn't have that uh, all of a sudden i don't ha- i don't have an access point for it on the road uh, earlier this year and then uh, I think you did a little bit of uh, Eastern Canadian dates recently Mm -hmm. and then now you're embarking on uh, Western Canada Um, how has the road experience been for you guys this year good it's been good right it's been really good yeah I I feel like being in other bands I'm always like there's so much pressure you know whereas I don't feel pressure with this band you know if I can't sing, somebody else will sing. <laughs> you know, if I can't play, somebody else will play. You know, it, that's how I feel. Like it's kind of, it's kind of like you you show up and you you do your part, and it's just really fun. I think a lot of times, you know, things I didn't like before, like outdoor festivals, I couldn't really get my head around doing outdoor right. festivals, and yeah, now I, I feel I different. Li- I like festivals now. Like I, I also thought I was just over playing live for a while. I just was burnt on it. I did it. I've been was doing it since the 90s and it's a lot of work and you come home dead and your friends have moved on and your girlfriends laugh to you and for another man like that's just the norm I was like "Ah, what's the point of this um and then I got really now I'm really into playing live again and I for I think I actually forgot that I enjoyed performing which is weird that that can happen like that you can just forget that oh yeah this is my favorite thing to do in the world and you're really good at it. Wow. <laughs> Say that again into the mic. <laughs> hey, 
and you're really good at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, now, after uh, this tour is done, uh, have you thought much about what's next for Mounties? I know you have your own projects. You're you're uh, finishing up an album yep. uh, with Steve and. Uh, um, yeah, you, you guys have albums, I think, in the can with your own projects as well, um, from what I read. Yeah. So uh, are you thinking much ahead with Mounties, or are you going to focus more on your individual projects next? Well, we're going to Europe in April, and in February, we're playing one show in... Is it Grand Prairie? Oh, are we? Prince George or somewhere oh, like there that? there is a show We're stuff? playing an Olympic show, yeah, that Olympic show. Oh, okay. I thought that was off, but okay. Just the one show, yeah. Oh, okay. And then after that... Uh, in February, we're spending the rest of February working on the next record. Okay. So, so then by April, we're going to go tour Europe, which we're excited about, and then we'll see what happens. We'll put the record out whenever it's finished. So we're not really, we don't have, you know, every date planned uh, in our future, but that's kind of what's on the horizon. And you're 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 not like taking a long break from Mounties, which I think people would be happy about. <laughs> no, <laughs> we we we're, we're really. We feel it now. We're, yeah. wanting, we're, we're wanting to do it now. So, and when we made this record, we spent about two solid weeks at different times collecting songs. So we have about fifty song bits that we can either finish or we can just continue to to write new ideas. So that's what we're going to do in February, and yeah. hopefully we'll. And then Steve and I will mix over the next few months, and hopefully we'll be done something, you know, by early summer. And then who knows when it'll be released? You never know. Hopefully soon, though. I feel like there's. It is easy. Some bands they get a, a bit of a buzz and then they just like go blow it at a you know some castle in Dublin or something you know for two uh, yeah. two or three years. It would be nice to get something out pretty quick. Yeah, and we want to stay on like. There's lots of things we want to do. Like we'd like to record in other locations and things. But right now we we still want to flesh out the what we've done already. We've done a lot of work in our studios in Vancouver and and we're not done there yet you know we feel like we need to play more there play more we've we've done a lot of rehearsals and and recording now at, at hawk's place so so we're just going to kind of do as much work as we can and then enjoy going to record in some castle maybe later on <laughs> and then ryan just finished the limb lifter album hawks is almost done his solo another solo record although it's almost like a new persona your new record or a return to the original persona yeah it's funny because the first uh the first record that Huxley put out was a big influence on how to heat make up the breakdown that's what we were all we all lived in a two bedroom apartment and that was the CD that was on all the time uh so it kind of makes sense that we're working together now because that was like a really critical point for me and then when people asked about that record uh it pissed me off if they didn't know who hoxley was at that time you know <laughs> they'd be like no i'm pretty sure you were listening to the cure no i wasn't <laughs> um and finally just to end uh i'm curious uh, about all your opinions on uh the state of canadian music right now uh to me it feels like in all genres across the board rock uh singer songwriters hip hop everything canadian music is thriving on um, the independent level we've got big artists out there too have you guys noticed that being in the in the music industry that like canadian music is hitting a high point right now well i think it's come around to people that the only people left are people that are making music for the right reasons and i think maybe that's why you're probably you know looking at music and going oh I can relate to this you know I think there was a period in the 90s and early 2000s where it was people that were trying to get rich you know where they where there was like oh they're doing that kind of music and there's a whole mess of them you know without mentioning names there's all these bands that was just like oh you're just trying to make money on this you know and mm -hmm. and I think that now what you're left with because there isn't money in the music industry you don't get into you don't get into music because you want to make a ton of money or in, in, unless you're like a DJ or you're working on a laptop or something, yeah. you know. So I think people that are still here and still making rock music or like alternative rock or whatever the genres are, are people that are actually really have something to say and really want to create something, and they're not just like driven by, you know, the economy of it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and you know what? Like, I have kind of of many minds on that. I sort of feel like, like most things, it's um, when the media decides. Like, you know, if, you know, a lot of music media or music criticism is just, it's it's more or less like, it's a har- you know, it's a harbinger of fashion more than it is maybe of like quality of music. But sometimes, when like the journalistic sensibility and the music sensibility kind of meets at the right time, like I remember when the big Montreal thing happened, and all of a sudden, like, you know, the the, the narrative was almost a bit like you know ah oh, Canada is finally making some good music thanks to Montreal it's like well we'd been making quite a bit of good music before but maybe there just wasn't like a a critical mass or something that that warranted a journalist writing about it you know I think that you know when you get two or three bands out of one city that are pretty good then all of a sudden a journalist can go oh I can make a statement <laughs> that says there's Montreal is really happening and especially if I'm the first guy to make that statement maybe I'll be the guy that makes the definitive statement that Montreal is really happening but I remember times in Toronto before Montreal where a lot of bands were a lot of sort of uh, <clears throat> interesting songwriting really interesting cabaret type songwriting I sometimes wonder if there's not always been pretty good music happening in this country it's just sort of when it's come out of one place at a time when a journalist thinks it's worth writing because there's a critical mass Time. Yeah. Sound check? Yeah. Uh, we're just smoking the stage. Oh, okay. okay. Well, yeah, thanks Thank so much, guys. This yeah, is great chat. Showbizmonkeys.com.